Okay. So I want to uh, um, uh, turn over the front end of this before we get into more conversation with each other uh, to sort of a catch up with uh, Vicky and Stacy and Trent, who along with me have been working on trying to conceive of what and how best to pull this stuff together. Mm -hmm. So um, Vicky or Trent or Stacy, I think Stacy's in transit still. So yeah, so come on. Yeah, so thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, and we had a really good discussion last time and we didn't want to lose that. We want to revisit it, uh, brought up some uh, really critical issues and, and discussion that we need to, we kind of wanted to address in a little more depth because that it was, uh, that's at the foundation of, of, of everything we'll be doing. So we wanted to revisit that kind of reboot a little bit with this session, come back, make sure we get a better handle of addressing the questions that come, and comments that came up last time. Um, and, and like we said, it was important if you missed that one, you'll kind of get a flavor of it uh, through our discussions uh, today. So uh, that'll be good. Um, if you haven't read the chapter uh, one and four, I believe. Uh, and we can't hear you. What? We're having trouble hearing you. Oh, it's because I'm in my actual office now. Okay, and, <laughs> there we go. And it's a lot harder than when I, I had a better system at home. So. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so we're rebooting a little bit. We're uh, revisiting those uh, in key questions that were asked last time that we ended with on that discussion. Uh, the thing for her that was uh, brought up. And so we, we decided to come back and address those and have a discussion around uh, a couple of those key issues. Uh, one of them, I guess the foundational piece, and you guys can correct me if, uh, if I missed a quote on this, is, is if you're new coming in to uh, working with, with a purchase position or a 1994 position and you're working with the tribes, uh, getting engaged and becoming a a trusted source within the tribe versus with your tribal member and you have folks coming from the outside and non-tribal members and engaging with those individuals, uh, timing and become part of the community and how both of them, how both of you do this. And it's, it's two different viewpoints coming in there with different metrics, potentially even uh, from a cultural perspective from the community perspective and then from the other side with the university perspective and push and some of the other demands on that and the non-native differences, I guess, that you'd have. Yeah. And I was just kind of pointing out that, you know, um, these jobs as a whole are not like your typical, you know, job where you go to work and by day two you should be delivering and you should be you know um, meeting deliverables already and that type of thing it takes a while and I think that it's important for this group to support each other and knowing that no one expects you to hit the ground running um, it takes a while to you know feel comfortable going to events and then once you do you know you'll start building that this is truly a trust and a time factor in in these positions um, within the tribes and so we just really want to point out that that's also one of the reasons we're trying to do this is to offer a support system so if someone's getting frustrated that they're not making any headway you know let's visit that so we can you know have a good state of mind um stacy you want to add to that yeah, I do. I just want to thank everybody for being here today, um, for continuing this professional development process with us. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is everybody's opinions, everybody's thought processes, and everybody's issues are important. And as much as we think we do know about issues, there's always somebody that knows more or has a different perspective that makes us think about things. And I think that's the one thing that I wanna keep open to this group is I want everybody to feel comfortable enough to share their thoughts and feelings because there could be some issues that come forward that are gonna make all of us vulnerable. And um, as we do our daily work, it's not easy to do extension work overall. 
it's not easy to work with tribes sometimes overall, but when you do see those successes um, from your programming, it makes everything all worth it. So I just wanna thank everybody for taking time out of your day to spend time with us today. Yep. So having said that, Let's a couple of uh, practical things. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to raise an issue, please uh, hit the uh, hand raise uh, button uh, down in reactions. Um, and uh, if any of our audios go kaplooey on us, um, if you would do the same thing to let us know so that we're not talking away without you folks being able to hear us. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if we could go into the, uh, um, uh, the PowerPoint there, Vicki. Um, and uh, I, I want to take us into very quickly into the parallels of what you just heard being discussed to the work of leadership. Teaching and learning, the role of a teacher is very, very, very parallel to the um, role of a leader, especially a collaborative leader. Um, and if you pop your way through down to, I think, um, slide three. I'm very conscious of the fact also here, Vicki, that we have at least one of our members who's gonna be leaving very quickly. And I wanna make sure we get into the meat of this quickly. Um, that there are lots of ways that teaching and leading are similar to each other. Uh, that they have a lot in common. What they have in common has a lot to do with how we build our relationships with each other in order to create an environment where people actually are learning stuff that's going to be helpful and useful, and people are actually leading in ways that are going to encourage and engage others to want to participate with them in the leadership activity. So go to the next slide. Um, the first way in which leading and teaching share a lot in common is they both happen in the head of the person who's sitting on the receiving end of what the leader or teacher is trying to do. If, if I'm sitting here as, as a teacher and you are not connecting with me in terms of things that are important in your world as a learner, then you're going to cancel me out very quickly. By that, I um, uh, go to the next slide. They begin with questions. They begin with learning to be able to see and understand what people want to learn so that you're giving them what they need, where people want to go so you're leading them where they want to get, what people see as their strengths so that you're attaching new knowledge to things they already know, what people see as their capacities to lead themselves because then what you're doing is you're engaging them as partners in the leadership you're doing, you're working on. We're engaging learners as partners in the teaching learning enterprise. We're engaging each other as partners in the leading and led relationship. Did I hear a question? No, sorry. Okay, so that goes to the next one, which is we have lots and lots of questions. Can we go to the next slide? We didn't hit on these questions very much in the first one because I sort of presumed that we were going to lean into elements of the book. And so I started out with definitions uh, and uh, um, 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 a conversation about models. Um, and, um, and what I didn't do is, is take us into the beginning point of what, what are you looking for in this work? And what are the leadership challenges you are facing? What is the world you are living in so that we can help improve our capacity to lead within the practical elements of the world in which you live? We only find that out through questions. So this is very weird, Vicki, because I've got yours and mine going simultaneously here. And it's just a it's, it's, it's a little schizophrenic. <laughs> what do you want to make sure we cover in our sessions together? What is it that we want to make sure we cover in this? 
Uh, these are that's a very first question that we ask each other in a learning environment. We would ask something very similar to that in a leading environment. Where are we trying to get to? What's the outcome we're aiming to accomplish? Hit the slide again. Once we move beyond what the big takeaway is that we're interested in, we want to get to what are the biggest challenges that we each think we're facing as collaborative leaders? What makes it difficult for us? Because that's going to be where we can focus to begin to make uh, our own improvements, to begin to uh, focus on the things for which we'll start to feel good about how we develop as a result of our teaching, learning, and our leadership with each other. What are the changes we want to make in ourselves? Um, so that first question is, uh, what do you want to make sure we cover during our sessions together? That's for all of us. The second question is for you. What are the challenges that make collaborative leadership especially difficult for you? And this will be where we're going to ask you to start identifying specific challenges that you're facing. One more shot. Everybody has uh, skills and attributes that, uh, that make them especially good at collaborative leadership. It's important that we uncover those in ourselves. Um, uh, I'm often asked to uh, help people find where their starting point is. What can they build upon as an effective leader? And the only one who knows the answer of that to that is going to be the individual themselves. So we're going to need you to explore that for a bit. So the first breakout session is going to be, I think there were only, what, about 10 of us on the screen? We have a total of 14. We do. So why don't we do uh, three groups of, uh, two groups of four and one group of five. And um, is that right? Did I do that arithmetic right? Yeah, I need to add a breakout, another breakout though. So give me a second. Okay, here we go. Okay, we are and set. Vicki, Stacy, Trent will each take a breakout room. So we're gonna have three or four, Vicki. We're gonna have three breakout rooms. Okay. And I'll take one, Trent will take two, and Stacy will take three. We do okay. need to hold just a moment for her to get to her office and get signed in. Or what we so, can do is I can start with that third one and then Stacy can take it over. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Do you want me so, to open the rooms? What I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, is there a way, Vicki, to keep those three questions on the on the screen while we go into the rooms? Mm, I would think I can share a screen in all three rooms. I just got to pop in and out of them. So let's try that. OK, what do you want to make sure that we cover together in these sessions? The big things, the takeaways that you want to make sure we cover if we're going to be making sure that we're developing ourselves collectively as a group of people who are better at collaborative leadership at the end of this than we were when we came into it. And then what are the biggest problems or challenges that you face that give you problems as you try to be a more and more effective collaborative leader and looking for real examples that we can capture so that we can work on them together. And then finally, what are your individual personal skills or attributes that you think you can use as your foundation to build your capacity to be an even better collaborative leader. Anybody have any questions about the questions? So, well, Hank, do you want to, these to everybody to write down their own individual as we're discussing these? And uh, or do you want us to kind of have a collective note? Um, yes, I think um, actually doing both, thanks for the question, Trent. Doing both would be helpful. If you record that for yourself, and then if we can have a conversation in each group that generates a recorded response to the group's thoughts on each of these. So I'm asking you to think as a group. I'm asking you to share your own sense of your own challenges with your colleagues in that group. And I'm asking you to share with your colleagues there information about what you think you have, you're particularly strong at, so that they're aware of that as well. Okay? And let's give ourselves, um, Let's give ourselves 15 minutes to start with, and then maybe Vicki, we could check in to see how that's going. You're in one, Trent's in number two. I'll take number three until Stacy, and you'll bump me out and put Stacy. Stacy is here now, so we're good. So the only thing I want to let Stacy and Trent know is that once you get in there, make sure you're recording in that breakout room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've made you both co-hosts, and, and I will. 
text me if you want me to come in and answer any questions. Mm, okay, that's great. Okay, let me get the rooms open and then, um, so I'm gonna open the rooms and then if we have too many in one room, then we'll just move you, but I have, you can assign yourself. Here we go. Does it show up for you guys? No. No, okay, um, then I'm just gonna assign. Okay. And I'll go into two. Two, okay. I'm just doing these one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then Vixie. What? Go ahead. Vicki, I'm going to uh, chat with you in here a little bit because I want to ask you a question after we go into our rooms. All righty. Um, okay, now I'm going to go into the rooms, guys, and see if I can get my share screen. So give me a second. My group made it, yay. <laughs> Is everybody back out? I might have left my group a little early. No. Um, I just closed it and it gives it a minute. I forgot it did that. I was giving them one minute warning, but okay. that gives everyone the time to wrap up. We had great discussion in ours. Yeah, we did too. At least I thought so. It's, uh... Todd, I was going to say to you as we broke up there, are you still on? There you are. I'm here. Um, 
I think a lot of the um, sort of principles that you're looking for on how to launch, how to negotiate, how to how to get into uh, the different partnerships and in, in ways that are going to be productive, that um, we got to get into the meat of the book because you're absolutely right. Those are the questions you were posing were remarkable questions and. Um, Let's see if by the time we finish up together, you're feeling good about it. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. I am. Too. I am too. Well, is everybody back in? Vicki, that was pretty seamless. That worked very well. Thank you so much. So much. Um, and thank Great you. Great discussions. Terrific discussion. Uh, I had the chance to bop in at least twice into each of the groups and got sort of a snapshot at different points in the discussion. And um, um, this was exactly the kind of information that's going to help uh, the four of us, I think, really be able to make sure that we are covering the bases that you're gonna wanna make sure are covered as we move forward on this. Um, you know, again, the, the, the process of being a teacher and the process of being a leader are so similar. Um, you know, if, if the people in the classroom don't feel like they're going to get a meaningful experience out of it, then they're going to start to turn off and the, and the teacher isn't going to be effective no matter how hard she or he tries. And if uh, the people involved in a leadership partnership don't feel that the, um, the focus is on the things that are important to them, um, that tap their individual needs and collective needs and that build on their strengths, then they're going to turn off too and you're never going to have the kind of relationship that allows collaboration to happen. So uh, we just uh, started to build the building blocks here for so much of what we're going to do together. Um, let, me, let me ask if um, anybody along with the three facilitators would like to give just a very quick synopsis of what came out of your sessions. I think I know that all of you got into one and two. I'm not sure if all of you got into question number three. So what do you wanna make sure it covers? Let's start with number one. Um, thoughts that emerged or, or sort of patterns that emerged regarding what do you wanna make sure we cover during our sessions? Do you want me to start that and then have my group chime in? Anything else? Yep. And let's just go real fast. We don't have to go. Okay, into yeah. All right, we got to all three questions just inadvertently because that third question is almost just, you know, parallel to everything that everyone's going through. So yes, tribal governments are huge. Um, we feel like there's gatekeepers, you know, we feel like they're overwhelmed and maybe just trying to do their own thing. And so, you know, that's a struggle. Um, a couple of ours, you know, and probably everyone, but they feel like they start programs and then the tribe sees them and they haven't been doing them. So they're like, oh, give that to us. So then how do you, how do you report your deliverable when you have no end outcome, but yet you're so happy to have created that program? Um, a huge thing that we would like to cover or at least address, and it's not gonna be easy, but how do you collaborate 94s and FERTEP when they're in competition? We had one individual that had shared her business plan and the competing individual pretty much stole all of her program and submitted it and got approved. So I encouraged our group just to have open minds. We're working on funding, but, you know, we have to have those tough discussions and really, you know, get to know each other so that when we have collaborations, we don't have that trouble with proprietary information. Anyone want to add anything? No, that was a great recap, Vicki, thank, thank you. Okay, good, all right, room two. Okay, so uh, I'll do the same thing, kind of go over and I'll certainly chime in folks if I'm, if I'm missing anything as a quick one, but certainly on the uh, things you're looking to get out of, everybody's looking to get out of this is just kind of the importance of, importance of partnering and, and establishing those partners and getting them going. Uh, learning tips, tricks to build the stronger collaboration for the areas that they're in and with the partners that they're in, but more meaningful ones, not just as a kind of a token. Trent, we can't hear you. I know it's, 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 I can't do anything about this uh, mic. Is this better? Yeah. I'm going to be eating it shortly here. <laughs> Lunch. Yeah, but uh, so the importance of uh, 
uh, uh, importance of partnering and learning tips, tricks to build a stronger collaboration and not just being thrown on something as a, a token, you know, actually being, building something that works. Those are things that we want to get out of this. Challenges is uh, as typical as this partnering, uh, even the partners are understaffed, the tribes are understaffed and uh, overworked, uh, time limited. They're just juggling university and tribal and uh, what they want and where they want to get out of each of the positions and where they're at with this stuff. Uh, do your best and you build up a program. And then uh, they want to expand, expand, and want more and more out of you, but they don't uh, recognize uh, from the university's perspective uh, the tribal components that need to go into that when you're building this up. And like you said, reporting back, it, it can be a challenge on that. And just the demands on time both ways across there, especially coming out. Um, university's not telling the individuals what's going on all the time when they're coming out to visit. They should be the conduit of, uh, between the university and the university needs to understand too that just because they're working with the tribe or, or uh, them or a tribal member doesn't mean they're working with the tribe. They have to get to understand more what you're working with the need to work with the council if you want to work with the tribe, but if you're working with individuals and stuff. So that's where I think those are some of the key points on that. And then just kind of uh, some of the attributes, what I think is true with all of these is for the most part, some of the key skills that everybody has as a, a FERTEP or a 1994 tribal extension is they are seen as a facilitator, go-to person, uh, somebody that can get things done and, and that liaison person between the university and the tribal members and communities. Did I leave anything out? I, I know I did. But. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll get a chance to go into more detail on this too. Thanks. Great notes. Great great conversation. Stacy. Uh, yeah, my group. We had the chance to go through all questions. I think we had. A dynamic group. It was small, but um, we had different parts of the country, which was nice. So you went from Oklahoma to New Mexico, um, which really shows the depth in our group. I mean, one of the things is um, I'm going to start it with time and I'm going to end it with time because that's one of the things is how do you find that balance of time between doing Indian education work finding that time for yourself and then being able to do everything well. So I think that's one of the big overlines, but when you get into the meat of what our group talked about is basically the lingo. Um, you know, everybody has their own lingo, even within the federal government. So depending on an acronyms, the federal government has a lot of acronyms. Well, every tribe is different too. And if you're dealing with 18 Pueblos, 50 chapter houses, the federal government, and then you've got students from all over the world. How do you balance that? And how on one side, it's so exciting that you have that and all the endless possibilities, but then also how do you do effective work? And that kind of relates back to time. And then one of our other biggest issues is especially within our reservations and interacting with different tribes, how do you consistently interact with the same people? Um, that becomes uh, one of the issues if you're not, um, because tribal councils turn over, tribal staff turns over, um, within your 1994, you may have people turn over within your FERTEP program. So how do you effectively do your job and run programs when you're dealing with different people all of the time. Um, and then going back to how do you speak that common language? We had actually the opposite between FERTEP and the 1862 in that our FERTEP agent believed that the 1994 extension program was her counterpart. And that was kind of her inroads into the reservation. So they had the insider knowledge, and then our FERTEP agent believed she was the outsider knowledge. Mm -hmm. So as a team, they were one. Um, 
and if they could work on different projects. So that was one of the big things within ours. And then the other thing is just knowing inside the tribe that goes back to, you know, in our group, it was called insider and outsider. I don't know if those are the correct terms. They sound a little negative to me. Um, but I do think we're, leave, we're working with those same dynamics in how you build those facilitations. Both of all of our crew felt that they were strong in collaboration. Um, they have the desire to collaborate and to lead. Um, our group also had a lot of comments about setting up the process but then allowing others to participate. So not doing everything because there's always an expectation that was felt on the reservation that the agent or educator should be doing it all. And just because you can do it all doesn't mean you should do it all, that you lay that groundwork. So Todd, did I miss anything that we need to put? I kind of wanted to end again with time because that's what hit me is, you know, you get so bogged down how do you find that time? Because, you know, in one situation you're teaching, they're teaching at the 1994, they're advising at the 1994, and then they're doing outreach programs um, to all these communities. And if you work with one particular tribe, the other tribes may get upset because everybody wants to have services. That's the other part of it. Todd, did I miss anything? Do you want to chime in? I think that sounds pretty, pretty, pretty on the mark. I am so excited by this. This is uh, extraordinary conversation. I had the chance to hear a little piece of what uh, was going on in group number three with Todd and Stacy there and Tricia. Uh, that um, um, and and they hit, I thought, in a little bit of a different way. What came up in a couple, the other couple of groups, uh, they, they talked about vocabulary or language a little bit. And it occurred to me what crossed my mind was how very often the vocabulary you use helps people know whether you're an insider or an outsider, to use that word you were using. You could tell whether somebody has done their homework or hasn't, if they understand the culture or the history or they don't. I remember when I lived in South Dakota, you could tell about, you know, somebody's uh, background by whether they referred to the capital as Pierre or Pierre. Uh, and uh, that tells you a lot about their personal histories as well. Uh, so uh, vocabulary is one of the things that any one of us in leadership and collaborative roles manipulates or manages or navigates. Uh, time came up in all of the discussions, I think, that, uh, you know, how do we get it all done in the time that's allotted to us and keep ourselves healthy? The other three manipulables or the three things that we can, can negotiate or manage as we, in order to help us be able to lead, our relationships, I keep coming back to that, systems and cultures. We have to be masterful at all five of those things, managing time, managing the way we communicate, the vocabulary and related, managing relationships, systems, and cultures. Um, and that's thematically what uh, I use to sort of cluster what's going to be the really exciting process of taking all this input, watching all these videos from each of the breakout rooms, sitting with Vicki and Trent and Stacy, and, and sort of reviewing all this stuff to cluster it into how do we approach each of these pieces so that people who raised them are gonna be able to see uh, lessons. How do we tackle these things in ways that we could take home with us and keep? Vicki, can we go back up onto the slides? Uh, Absolutely. While Vicki's doing that, is there anybody besides the three uh, uh, facilitators and myself who would like to say something out of that session? I want to prepare us to go into actually uh, a next session with us. Um, and this will be a very brief one. Um, I, okay with everybody if we go until 2.30? That's my time, whatever it is your time. I'm on the East Coast. Um, can we get one more slide up? Yeah, and I was just going to let you know that if you have to get off, we understand, but if you can stay, we would love it. I don't know why. My Good. Slow. And we'll be following up with a communication to all of you um, as we close this down at the end. But uh, are you having I problems? I that's 30 more minutes is what Hank is asking. I'm locked out. Yep. Hold on. 
You know why I'm knocked out. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, in talking about the relationships, one of the challenges that that I've noticed since being in this position is that um, some of our colleagues in in even tribes with the, under the University of Idaho uh, look at each other as um, competition because we all compete for the same dollars even though we're under the same university. That being said, what we've been able to do, and when I say we, um, what we're referring to as the North Central Idaho Intertribal Collaboration, so Coeur d'Alene Tribe and Esperance Tribe, is building that collaboration together and doing, setting the comp competitive side to the left. And it, it, it's working out really well, but um, it, because it just makes sense doing away with that competition side of things. We know that we go to write for the FERTEP grant that our, you know, our packages are going to be sent in and, and looked at, you know, and evaluated, but it's going to be more on of our, of our program, but not looking at each other as you're my competition. I can't share. I won't share. We're trying to build our programs together. And it's just felt so much better. Once I knew what they wanted, you know, where we were both at on the same place, and now we're working program together. But, you know, for the first five years, it seems like that was, that was just what I was told. That's what I felt. That's what I seen. And so I really resisted building those relationships and kind of held close whatever program I was developing for what somebody else had talked about that it was, somebody else took it over. Somebody else took it on as their own. But I mean, that's just another level of collaboration that we contend with within the work that we do is do we collaborate and how much with those that we are quote unquote in competition with for FERTEP dollars. And in the real <laughs> world of, of, of economics and politics, um, we are always going to be in competition with folks who have a great deal to offer us in terms of, of collaborative contributions. Um, so uh, this is an, this is this is a problem we all face, but that I think is um, perhaps exacerbated or stronger in the context in which you're working. Um, you know, one of the very interesting things that um, uh, came up in the conversations with Trent and Vicky and Stacy was the uh, uniqueness of what essentially amounts to, and we could hold it right there if we would, Vicki, what essentially amounts to a, um, the, the two by two um, uh, matrix of systems and culture in which all of you operate on a daily basis. You know, you're not, everybody, everybody who does leadership, everybody who does teaching, deals with language, deals with time, deals with relationships. Um, and doing a lot of that is just doing um, uh, your empathy, your, your attention to details, uh, and your homework. Um, the complications that are most striking are the constant face-to-face um, uh, uh, -face that you deal with in terms of very different systems you have a college system and you have a tribal system. Systems having to do with belief systems, norms, values, and so forth. Uh, I'm sorry, systems are governance, structure, and decision-making. Uh, systems are governance, structure, and decision-making. And then the cultures that are at the core of even why we're doing what we're doing here. And that's the belief systems, the norms, the values, the language and related that we, uh, that we grow up with in our different cultures and that we have to navigate as we bring those cultures together. So we are crossing back and forth across systems. We're crossing back and forth across cultures every day in our work. Um, and that's more pronounced in your world than it is in many others. So I wanted to uh, give this group a chance 
to um, um, really help to lay out some groundwork for our four of us to get together and think about uh, the particular challenges, opportunities, and resources that uh, this uh, crossing back and forth between different systems, crossing back and forth between different cultures creates for you as collaborative leaders. What do we have to pay special attention to that's created by the dual cultures and the dual structures in which you have to operate? Does my question make sense to you? Yeah, it, uh, it does. Um, if I could just, was that Danielle talking about the collaboration within your um, university? Yes, yes. Okay. That's interesting, some of the things that you were saying, because I think by nature, I just wanted to add this, uh, just by nature, I think academia is competitive itself. Um, to, in order to go through the promotion process, the things that they look at in promotion are you know, things that you have done. So when you collaborate with a team on something, um, then you say your team members are all going up for promotion at the same time, it becomes somewhat of a battle. And, and I've seen this of who did what and who was responsible for what. So there's also that, um, you know, that competition within the institution that we work in for the work that's being done. Some people want to claim a lot more um, that they did a lot more on projects in Indian country than they actually did um, just because it's necessary um, to achieve promotion. And I think, Danielle, I'd like to just say something. There is nothing good about FERTEP having to write for their projects every four to five years. I mean, there isn't anything good. Unfortunately, that is the situation that we're in. And I think you're finding that you're probably building your collaborations more carefully um, because of that. And you're really focusing on your relationships. And my hope, it sounds like you have a good coordination with Coeur d'Alene and Nez Perce, is that if you can find a way to where that boosts both of your projects so that the entire state continues to get FERTEP funding. I know that's not easy. And I think in my darkest hour, um, and Hank really helped me understanding that university systems are built on ego. So, um, and that's one of the things that he said that really hit home to me because you're not only getting the bureaucracy of the 1862 system and that of the tribal government, you're also getting that of the federal government and the farm bill and having to reapply for your job. So I hope through this process that you'll bring up some of those maybe vulnerable issues that we all need to think about because it's not easy to collaborate. It's not easy to be part of the team because Shirley's exactly right. When you're going up for promotion or you're rewriting that grant proposal, you need to take credit so that you look, your programs look great, that your programs should be continued to be funded, if I'm making sense. I think you're making terrific sense. I think uh, if I could drive that home a little bit more deeply, um, there's probably no other system in the United States that is more Eurocentric uh, and predicated on European uh, sort of antiquated European culture and uh, priorities than is uh, higher education. Um, you look at the regalia, you look at the titles, you look at the requirements for tenure and promotion, um, you look at the whole culture. And what you see is a nose-to-nose -nose, uh, competition predicated on very old-fashioned notions of what is valued. And what's valued is your ability to get out there, publish more, um, and publish more quickly than any of your peers. Um, and it is a very difficult, I've watched this any number of times in higher education, it's very difficult to introduce uh, collaborative strategies that are aimed at changing not just systems, but culture in higher education. So for instance, what does a collaborative publication really look like? 
and can each author uh, be able to benefit for purposes of promotion uh, from their contributions to a collaborative publication, a collaborative text or book? Um, um, and uh, do we really value community engagement and leadership as much as we value scholarship on most colleges and university campuses? Uh, these are all things that um, as universities go through the economic malaise that I think everybody's going to be going through over the course of the next decade or so, uh, these are things that we're going to have a chance to influence, I think. Um, we're going to have a chance to start thinking in terms of how the culture of higher education can benefit from not just living alongside the culture that we're learning, that I'm learning from tribal context, but also begin to adapt some of the features of that that can contribute to a more collegial collaborative capacity on the college campuses. So forgive my screed on that folks, but I think you hit on a very important topic. You are dealing with um, a culture that is built to be resistant to what we're trying to do in the context of this work. And I just add one more thing to that uh, from a the tribal perspective, can everybody hear me or am I cutting anything else? Hey, you're good. You sound great. Okay, so uh, I see from the university standpoint, I'm taking Arizona as an example of this, that, uh, you know, we're under a lot of water crunches right now. So, and the tribal water rights is a, is become an increasingly important issue. And, but I see a lot of folks now wanting that collaboration where they never thought about it before because they're in these stressed times. And to me, that's, that's not the correct approach. They should have been having relationships long before that. And that's where some of us uh, the, the tribal extension has and has been. So it, then it becomes a kind of a guarding the gates kind of thing. So, uh, you know, cause you want the right thing for the tribe and you want the right thing for extension but you're getting these outside pressures because of this, uh, it, it, these unique situations. And it becomes a balancing act when the economics start to pressure them to look at these different options. And then it's just, you know, because you don't want to introduce things, uh, people in, to the communities that you've been working in, building up and driving that may come in and just really abuse or just, just blow it out of the water. That's another, I think, um, increased burden on a lot of the tribal uh, agents, and uh, even in 1994s, too. I think it would be valuable, I'm not going to suggest we drop into groups, but I think it would be valuable to shift the uh, lens for just a second and ask ourselves the question of what are the opportunities for our higher ed institutions, for them to benefit from the partnerships with our tribal communities. And I'm not talking about financial benefits, I'm talking about other sorts of benefits. I think we have discussed this in our uh, breakout room earlier, that uh, we could get uh, inroads from the tribal colleges and universities because they're like what you have called the insiders. So uh, in terms of doing uh, programs, then if you collaborate with them, then it would be easier to get into the, the community uh, with the help of those TCUs. Others. Can anyone else chime in? The more you guys respond, the easier it will be for us to tailor this. Stacy, I, I think later on this afternoon, I have a presentation to the Western Extension Directors and the Ag Experiment Directors from the 1862s. And John Phillips asked us to do a specific ask of them. And my specific ask of I think the 1862s, and I think the tribal colleges already do this because they're on the reservation, they're chartered by a tribe. 
they invest, and this is financial, Hank, in a way, um, but it goes to the relationship buildings. Not many of our 1862s invest in Indian country. They just don't um, with all of their dollars. And 1994s invest only in Indian country. And um, I think that 1862s need to start investing. And I mean, if that goes to, I mean, I look at Nevada and all of our agents are 100% grant funded. They depend on FERTEP funds. You know, if they lost a FERTEP, if we go through in FY22 and we lose a FERTEP contract, then we've either got to have other grant funds to make that up or that position goes away. And I don't think that should be the case. I do think that we need our 1862s to value our Indian country educators, period. Whether they're from a 1994, whether they're from an 1862 and to start to build those collaborations and invest. So um, that's just my, my take on it all because I, I just don't like um, the situation that our FERTEP agents are put in to not only do their job, but not having a job. And, you know, I'm eager to learn too how the 1994s handle that because they deal with a lot of grant funding too. And so is that investment, is it trying to get the tribes to invest too? That's another thing. So. I really appreciate that, Stacey. Um, we're, we've been having that conversation um, amongst, um, we have a, a DEI task force at the University of Minnesota. And um, it's a conversation that we're having about all BIPOC is that those programs that serve BIPOC communities are typically grant funded. They're not, the, the educators are not on solid dollars. Um, so it, it's a problem probably all over the place. And as far as the uh, 1994s go, I, work with three tribal colleges and their extension programs are, are solely funded out of, of the federal funds that they get. There's no extra dollars coming from the tribe to have those programs. So I'm not sure that they would be there if not for the funding that's coming out of um, the federal government. So that's a big question is people appreciate our programming and they come to our programming, but who's really investing in us? And that's a great point. And in our room, number one, we talked about, you know, that these aren't traditional jobs where you show up day one and day two, you're like delivering. And the hardest part with this, and so I'll use me as an example, South Dakota lost three of our agents, North Dakota had none. I did a, you know, a um, contract with SDSU to do Standing Rock, but then it's done. So who, if we ever get these programs back, to rebuild those relationships, you're at square one because that's what I think we're failing to get across that to build these relationships takes a very long time. And they are relationships for someone to trust you, to talk to the things about their ranch, their struggles, their, you know, I mean, you guys are full-time extension agents, part-time counselor, part-time you know, accountant. You're, you wear many, many hats, all of you. And I think one thing that we have to watch uh, a little bit from the, the university standpoint is uh, they will say that they already have a lot of funds invested in, uh, in tribal education. Those could be a lot of uh, uh, educators, uh, professors who are on campus, but don't go off campus. And so if need to be more specific to actually helping the individuals, helping the tribes on the ground. Not so much, yes, okay, we've hired a tribal member as a faculty and, and they are in teaching, which is good, that's that's positive. I'm not saying that's 100% negative, but it's also getting like Stacey time on the ground out there with those individuals and, and getting that extension mission out there and not just the, on the teaching component, because that we're also seeing to, as a, from an extension standpoint, you are the, the outreach or you are the first response uh, from 
community members to the university and, and vice versa. But that's where, as far as it goes on the funding side. So, uh, you know, once the students get to the university, then they get there. And we have a comment in the chat from Tracy just saying it's almost impossible to get campus administrators to come to our extension office on the reservation, even pre COVID. So now we're like, yeah. you know, Expedite, you're exponentially making that more difficult. Okay, Hank, we have two minutes. Do we have any closing remarks from you? Um, let's talk about next. Our, okay, so first I wanna point out to everyone, our next workshop is not until the end of July. We only did two back-to-back -to, -back to get us started and to kind of get everyone in the groove. So our next one is in July. Um, I will get the specific date, but so when we're 20, yeah. And when we're done with this, I'll change the Zoom. But so on your calendars, it would have shown up every every single Wednesday. But in fact, now we will go to that, thir that last Wednesday of every month until Kansas City. Thank you for all your efforts too. Our team appreciates it. We know two back to back was a lot but i think we're getting going really strong and um we look forward to july hank so very quickly um uh, two things first thank you so much this was a terrific session um thank you thank you i um want to uh, first of all is there anybody who has not yet received the book so i have not received the book okay can can we help rebecca make sure she gets the book um, and uh, I'd like to ask, it's um, functionally, it's about 100 pages of reading, and we have now about a month before our next session. I want to encourage everybody, as I did a little bit earlier with Todd, um, to uh, take the time to read the book, uh, rather than us doling it out in sections. Let's get the whole book under our belts so that we can refer back to pieces of it and, uh, uh, and all of us will have that language. I don't have to worry so much about introducing vocabulary uh, if we're all reading the book together. Um, so please do that. Uh, and if you have any questions, you have my email address, feel free to contact me. Um, and in addition to that, um, so that we get back on the theme of being able to apply this work uh, into individual projects. You remember that I think Vicki had sent out the request that you identify two collaborative enterprises you're involved in right now, two organizations or partnerships or teams or councils or whatever it is you're involved in that has a collaborative nature to it. Uh, identify two of them so that we can um, sit down together when we get together next and identify the ones that are gonna lend themselves to your being able to do sort of laboratory work in applying this stuff as we go forward. Okay, any questions for me? It is now exactly 2.30. God bless you, stay well. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy Independence Day, Kathleen. Yes, okay, great. We'll see everyone in July. Enjoy your long weekend and thank you for your time today. I know a lot of you could have checked out and gone on vacation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Yeah.